Well, another amazing podcast with a, a new friend, a new brother named Jay Nixon. And we had a great conversation. And, you know, one of the core things that we talk often about is just how uh, how much of our story is written around the, the meaning that we've given it. Mm-hmm. And so much of our symptoms and our f- physical health and whatnot are really tied back to how we've um, maybe misinterpreted or interpreted uh, our trauma or history or, or the different challenges we went, went through. Mm-hmm. And so much of that can show up in our physical health, right? Yeah, because it really frames the beliefs that we have about ourselves. And then it starts to frame the choices that we make every day. And then it results in some sort of possible discomfort, whether it's weight gain or ch- with challenges with pain or hormones or whatever it might be for us. But often it's being fed by this story and this belief. And that's the conversation that we get into with this um, podcast. I mean, yes, he's like, he's in the fitness world and he was in the supplement world before and the pharmaceutical world before that. And so it's really interesting to talk to someone that's been in these different industries and worlds and still go back to that bigger picture of the mindset and beliefs. Yeah. And and I think something is interesting too in this conversation is like, there's little messages that we get when we're young and, and like, there's almost repeating messages that, that we start to really reflect back and realize like, oh, like that was an interest of mine. And that was, that was something that was impactful and that helped to shape me and how I think about things now. And I think it's a, it's a great little reflection for each person that tunes in to go, oh, all these little moments and all these experiences I had in my life are so much a, a result of where I am now mm-hmm. for, for better or for worse. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's that insight and that introspection that comes as a result of looking back where we can make massive change in our health because now we've identified some of these places where we're stuck or these places where we can step into freedom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a great conversation and we'd love to hear your thoughts and insights that might show up while we're speaking with Jay. So, so many times people come into the clinic and they're like, hey, I want to lose weight. You know, I want to get ready for the vacation. I want to... Um, I want to fit into the clothes that I used to fit into, or, you know, I, I just, I want to feel better in my body. I don't like how I look. I want more energy. Yeah. I could change my hormones or change just how I feel um, in general in life and want to be on purpose again. Yeah. And so much of our, our health is geared towards like how we look physically and how we, how we move through our day. And, and, and not often are we looking deep enough at some of those inner patterns of why we're stuck, mm-hmm. you know, why are we presenting with symptoms in the way that we are. Mm-hmm. And so that so that led us to wanting to create a, a program that helped us to not only get results on, you know, shifting our metabolic function and losing weight and all, all those, you know, um, goals that we have for ourselves, but starting to really help people understand the reason why. What mm-hmm. was the, hormone of the, uh, the hormonal science behind metabolism, metabolic function, what's happening inside of our cells, how, what kind of fuels are we accessing on a regular basis, right? Mm-hmm. And just that relationship with self and relationship with food, which are both very intimately connected because how we see food and how we use food is usually a direct reflection of how we're seeing and utilizing or understanding life that's happening to us or for us. So this four-week program really helps to include that self-discovery process for you and at the same time getting those physical results so that energy can come back that relationship with the metabolism can change and you can really start to see yourself from all the different angles that you are. Yeah. So we're talking about the metabolic upgrade. It's one of our online programs. We do this uh, live in on online in a group setting, or you can also access it on your, the do it yourself version. Mm-hmm. So right. if you go to drjensen.com, you'll find our metabolic upgrade there and make sure if you do do it, please let us know how it goes. Cause we've been loving hearing the stories and the transformations from others. What's up again, everybody? Hi, welcome back to another episode of Health Ignited with uh, myself and Dr. Sonia Jensen. And we've got a fun conversation, a new friend of ours that we got a chance to, to connect with just before we got on the call today. And so I'm going to introduce him and then we'll get into the conversation. So this gentleman, his name is Jay Nixon, and he's an accomplished speaker, an author, a coach. He's, he's an ambassador, one of the original ambassadors for Lululemon uh, and dubbed by C- CBS News as one of the best fitness and nutrition experts in the business. So hold on to your seats. This is going to be a great conversation. Uh, He's also the author of an incredible book that really speaks to the core issue of why we gain weight. And it's called The Overweight Mind. 
the undeniable truth behind why you're not losing weight and the purpose of pain, how to turn tragedy, tragedy into triumph because life's not supposed to suck. Love that message, Jay. Um, there's so much more to say about you, and you know that, that's you enough. Like, that is yeah, that's, enough. that's my We're least favorite part of these. I can't stand <laughs> that. Like listening to something about yourself is the worst. I always, I always want to take my headphones out. Yeah. Oh, I know. I well, do, yeah. Maybe that's a belief that we need to step into as well you, for you. you well, you, you know what? I just I hear myself talk so much that to hear somebody else talk about me in a positive. But you're right. I need to get a better belief system. Yeah, receive it. Just, just receive it. I'm going to be more cool yeah. with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's important because, you know, yeah. it, obviously sharing someone's bio gives a little bit of the story and the passion and really what you're interested in. But yeah. before even like, I guess, getting into all this cool stuff that you're doing now, you shared a really amazing story of like how you, how you came here, like you know, starting in nursing in your 20s and then moving, you know, forward through all different aspects of, of healthcare from, you know, the pharmaceutical side into, into the nutritional world. So please yeah. let's, let's buckle up for a little journey of, of your story and then let's, uh, let's see where it takes us. Yeah. I, you know, always growing up, I was fascinated with the human body. Um, I told you guys, I grew up in a really small town. And so our, an excursion for us was driving like an hour to like a, a real town that had a mall. And so my, I'd go with my mom and my mom would go shop in the mall. And I remember I would go to GNC general nutrition center, which was like, you know, back, this is back in like the 80s, was the only place that sold vitamins or had things like that. And I would go in GNC and I would read all the labels. And I'm, I'm a little kid, like I'm in, you know, I'm seven, eight, nine years old. I'd read all the magazines. Like I was just fascinated with the human body and like how it did what it did. And, you know, I look at the pictures of the, of the bodybuilders and, and things of that nature. So I was always just really interested. Caveat to that, I was a chubby kid. And I was, I was using, so the reason I wrote my, the book, the purpose of pain, which is my second book is my father was killed when I was five. And I didn't realize it at the time, obviously when you're five, you don't have a whole lot of recall. Um, and then I had a, quite a few more like deaths in my, in my life by the time I was 25. And I realized that I used to use food as my kind of like weapon of choice or, or comfort or what I perceived to be a comforting thing. And so I'm in GNC, but I'm a chubby kid because I'm using food to try to comfort myself. But I'm fascinated with health and fitness and these people who are in phenomenal shape. And so it was kind of like a, a really paradoxical thought process for a youngster. Um, started lifting weights when I was like 11 years old and I just got into sports and I was just, I've always been fascinated with the human body. Like I've said that like 27 times. And so I thought I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to be a doctor, right? This sounds awesome. Um, went to um, college and played college football. And then when I stopped playing football um, after my sophomore year, because of like concussions and things like that, I kind of lost my identity and I really lost my drive for education. So I said, okay, maybe doctor's not the right path for me. Cause that's like, I, I did the math. I'm like, that's a lot more years of me doing this and not, you know, actually doing the things that I want. And so I got into nursing and I'm like, this will be awesome, right? I'll get my nursing degree, then I'll become a nurse anesthetist, and I'll kind of like move my way up the food chain that way, but while still making money and, and doing something with my hands. Did that for a couple of years and absolutely hated it. Like I remember coming home at the end of, of a shift or from the hospital and being like depressed. I'm not 100% sure I can do this. And then finally I made the decision. I'm like, you know, I'm in my young 20s. I'm like 23 years old. I'm like, there's no way I can live the rest of my life doing this because I'm a, I'm a doer. I'm a really type A personality. And, if, you know, even though I wasn't qualified, I would see something that Jay thought should be done. And, you know, I want to go do it, right? You can't do that. Obviously, the medical world, that's a highly um, <laughs> frowned upon. But like, you know, somebody could be going out. I remember when I was in nursing school, like somebody was going down the hallway there and they, they crashed in the hall. I'm a nursing student and I jump on the gurney and start giving the, and my teacher's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, this is what we're here for. Like, that's, I love that part of it, but I knew I couldn't do the, the minutia of the job day in and day out because I felt defeated every day. So I got out of that, got into, um, went to work for like the largest nutrition company in, in the country. Cause like I said, I've always been fascinated. That was um, at the time it was optimum, optimum nutrition and American bodybuilding did the whole like bodybuilding thing and, you know, went to shows and sold supplements, kind of transitioned out of that thinking again, like, you know, 
I'm supposed to have a, you know, company car, corner office, you know. So I go into the pharmaceutical world, work for GlaxoSmithKline, which is one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world. Um, so I've had these really great jobs with really great companies. But like I told you guys, I was walking around the hospital one day and I just kept getting this overwhelming feeling of this isn't right. Like you're, you know, y- yes, I believe pharmaceuticals help people. I think there's a purpose for everything, but I've got a lot of beliefs around it that don't serve me as being a, a person who's out there peddling those drugs. Like I told you guys, I was diagnosed with um, psoriatic arthritis when I was like 12 or 13 years old and I've never taken a medication ever hesitate to even take an Advil. And so I said, you know what, Jay, this isn't right for you. So I left the pharmaceutical world, got back into nutritional consulting, consulted for the NFL alumni, which is a really cool gig for um, a couple of years. I basically just went to golf tournaments and talked about nutrition to people that I'd grown up watching on TV my entire life. So it was a pretty sweet gig. Um, then decided just to start my own business, decided that, you know, I could help more people if I was um, doing my own thing. So I opened up my own gym. I started my online coaching transformation business, wrote a couple of books. I've got my own supplement line now. And uh, I've got a podcast that, where I talk about all this same kind of awesome stuff that you guys talk about. And now that's where we're here. I'm 48, feel great, feel like I'm just starting. And, uh, you know, I'm ready to just help as many people as I could possibly help. Yeah. I love it. It's funny because when you said you're 48 earlier, I was like, I feel like I'm older than you. Like you, you, I, you, you, you got so much vitality and vibrancy. Like, and I, and I, and I like to think that, you know, we do everything we can to take care of yeah. ourselves. So I'm, I'm just recognizing, you know, someone who's doing the same. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. you know, well, without well, the well, beard, I look really young. I tell people yeah. I'm almost 50 <laughs> and they're like, they, they check my ID. So, right. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said so many important things in your story that I think we can unpack. And I'm hoping that the listeners kind of caught on to some of the nuances of what you shared and, one of the big things that you shared was um, the story around your father and the trauma mm-hmm. that you carried as a young child. And we often talk about what that does to the brain, what that does to that survival mechanism in our body and mind so that in the future, when we have triggers and moments that feel similar, we often have a, like you chose the word weapon or something that brings us back into that space of safety or familiarity. And it's a story that I can definitely resonate with because I had anorexia as a child or in my teens um, because of a trauma that I experienced when I was eight Uh years old. And so I think that's such an important story to unpack for people to recognize that these micro traumas and big T traumas dictate everything in our physiology and the decisions that we make. So even your psoriatic arthritis, it's like the body's way of saying that one is in pain. And often as a child, we can't recognize that. So I'm curious from your perspective with all the individuals that you've worked with, How do you support them in recognizing that? Because I know it's in your book, the the weight that they're not losing or the energy that they don't have or all the decisions that they're making that they know up here and consciously doesn't serve them. How is that connected to the story that they've been carrying with them up to that point? Totally. Before I even get into that, I firmly believe that my psoriatic arthritis is a representation of the trauma that I Mm -hmm. attach to that. And I know some people are like, oh, no, you just get things and whatever, like, Maybe, but I'm confident that, that, you know, the pain that is in my hands is related to the trauma that I experienced when I was five. And then there's a other series of a lot of things because I held on to it. I didn't know how to release it. Mm-hmm. And so I think it mani- it has to manifest itself into some form. And in me, it shows, well, I'll, you know, this is what we'll do. And so having that experience and understanding that and, and knowing what, what trauma sounds like, looks like, and can present itself without actually hearing the story, right? So I know what happens for me is, you know, I think I'm being called to do things. Like, I think this is exactly what I'm supposed to do for the reasons that of the things that I've gone through. Because everybody that's struggling with weight loss, or I shouldn't say everybody, that's a bold statement. I'll say 99% of people who struggle with weight loss, or at least that come into my world, the weight loss is a byproduct of something else. And so, you know, I use fitness and nutrition as, as, like I told you guys, as a way to get people into my world so that I can now start to help them unpack the very thing that's causing that, right? So weight loss, weight gain, and or I believe weight gain and weight loss are both side effects. One's a negative side effect, one's a positive side effect. 
And what I mean by that is when you start to address the real issues, and it's like, it's probably very much what you got, you guys deal with. Somebody comes into me and says, Hey Jay, like, and they start telling me their story. The first version is never really the real version. I mean, it's the real version, but it's a very watered down, like soft, easy, everybody's going to be cool. Nobody's going to cry today version. And then when I start to unpack, right. Cause I'm, I've been doing this long enough. Like luckily almost being 50 has given me a little bit of wisdom. So I'm able to see through those things and I'm like, okay, cool. Hey, I love that first version. And then I start asking a series of questions that I'm just psychologically programmed to ask. And then we finally start to unpack the real reasons why they are in the situation that they're in. And then I just try to get them to understand that like, Hey, this, this weight situation that we're in, we want to blame it on, drive throughs and, and fast food and candy and sugar. And sure, those are contributing factors. But if I take that away from you, you'll find something else to, I don't like the word, but you'll find some other way to, to do the thing that you're already doing, right? And so once I start to unpack those things with them and I really tap into their belief systems about why they are where they are. And, and then there's always, there's always, always, always either a micro or a macro trauma that's occurred in some way, shape or form. Um, doesn't have to be a tragedy, but it could be a series of events. Maybe it's a, you know, a, a divorce or a bankruptcy or a whatever, you know what I mean? It, everybody's story is different, but they're all have the same value, right? Because they're ours. Mm-hmm. And so I just start to unpack those things. Some people like that because then they're like, oh, wow, now I get it. Other people are like, you're a quack. I'm just going to look for the next diet, which I totally respect because it's, it's a, it's, it's heavy, right? It's a heavy road to go down. Um, and so, you know, but I feel, I feel like, and that's why I wrote my first book, the overweight mind, because I realized that like, I'm doing you a disservice if I just help you lose all this weight and then I let you go. And then now you're on your own. And then next thing you know, I see you six months from now, you've gained it all back. Like i I'm too compassionate for that. Like, and so I really want to get down to the real reasons why you are here in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got such an interesting story. I mean, I'm always just so in awe of hearing people's story and then, and then just to hear them slide and and be and, and live from their purpose because you have such an eclectic view on so many different things. Like I mean, I, I totally resonated with, with uh, going into the supplement stores as a kid. I remember doing that. Yeah. Like I, I used to just love being in a supplement store and, and part of it, maybe it was like the aromas or. Just... I was going to say, there's a weird smell that like <laughs> I love. And I'm like, I could, when you said that I could smell it. And I'm like, I'm yeah, a weirdo. Like, like this is so weird. Vitamins or something. <laughs> but there, there was something about it. Like there, there was, there was like this cultural desire for health and, and, you know, and so you, you had that as sort of a staple throughout all these different lenses that, that you got to experience to, yeah. so that you could truly come from a really a, eclectic perspective and where you are now. And, and you, you shared some cool stuff just about being in the pharmaceutical world as well. And like, at some point you recognize that you weren't going to take the medicines that you were encouraging right. other people to purchase. Totally. Well, talk, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's important. Like yeah. you, you recognize you were not in congruency with your own belief system. And and that's always been really important for me. I've always been like a really like, I mean, personal development, maybe the wrong word, but I've always been really driven to evolve my perspective. You know, one of my core beliefs is I'm always confident, but sometimes wrong. And I, and I reserve the right to change my mind once I get new information. And so I've always been, I love science, right? And so, and I love the quest for new info. And I love, I love it when I prove myself wrong, because I'm like, okay, cool. Then now I can be a better version of me because I've got this new intellect that I didn't have before. And it doesn't mean that that version of me was a moron. I was just dealing with the info that I had. And so the pharmaceutical thing was kind of bizarre. It was, it was in a time of when the nutrition world was kind of like in flux. You, I don't know if you guys will remember like when ephedra um, got banned, right? Mm -hmm. So ephedra used to be able to be sold in anywhere. Like you could walk into a GNC and buy as much ephedra as you wanted to um, and then there were a couple of deaths. There was a, a major league baseball player. There was an NFL football player. And so it kind of became under scrutiny. Um, and then ephedra made up about 60 to 70% of the nutrition market at that time. So a lot of companies went out of business because you could no longer sell it. And it just, the, the entire industry just got wild. And so I said, okay, you know, as, as somebody who's always looking to, to better myself, I said, okay, 
what what should you do, Jay? Should you stay here, ride this out, figure it out? Or should you try to take the next step up the ladder perceivably? And, you know, this was back, like I said, you know, late 80s, early 90s. Or no, it was, no it, was, it was like late, I mean, 90s into the 2000s. And so I'm still in that mindset of like, you know, the life is you're supposed to have a, you know, a corporate job, company car, expense account, wear a suit, business card, the whole nine yards. And so I went through the whole process, got hired by GlaxoSmithKline and perceivably on paper had made it like, you know, six figure salary, company car, unlimited expense account, you know, basically it's, it's not a difficult job, right? You're just really, you know, you've got two or three drugs. You go from doctor's office to doctor's office, hoping to get 30 seconds to say, Hey, how you doing? You know, talk about your drug, you know, you, know, you guys know the drill. And I just started like after about a year of doing that, after like the honeymoon phase wore off of like, Hey, this is really cool. I've made it. I started getting that feeling of, there's something else, right? This you're what you're doing on a daily basis isn't congruent and it isn't in alignment with who you are. Like you literally won't take an Advil if you have a headache. You're like, I just need some water, right? So I'm I'm like the most holistic person I know. And so I just started like having conversations with myself about that. And so as the conversations got bigger and I got, you know, more willing to, you know, say, Hey, Jay, this isn't right. I decided then that it was time to like, you know, maybe, maybe the corporate gig wasn't the right thing for me. And so I left that. And then I, that's when I, I kind of transitioned back into the world of nutrition and went over and started consulting um, with the NFL alumni. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, It wasn't right. I just, it was a feeling. I don't, I can't really describe it. It was like, when I was there, like, I just, I didn't want to be there. And I'm the kind of person where I can't phone it in. Like, I get up at three o'clock in the morning, every morning, because I love what I do. And it's like, I'm ready to get up and go. And so I know if when the alarm goes off at three, if I'm not ready to go, that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such an important point to make. And for people to maybe reflect for themselves in their life, or what are the things that we're doing, because we feel like we have to, or we should, or we've been conditioned to believe that this is the definition of success. And then we make these choices that aren't congruent and often are I call them the soul whispers like the soul is continuously speaking to you whether it's through the body like with symptoms or maybe it is that level of fatigue in the morning something's always telling you when you're not being congruent but we're so used to pushing that aside to just get the thing done or get through the day or try to live up to that definition of success right that's what we're supposed to do right yeah. yeah so how do you help somebody that's in front of you unpack that for themselves Love when that. you're working with them? One of the questions I always ask is once I, you know, once I get to know them, we have some dialogue back and forth. You know, I think rapport is, is one of the, the key, you know, factors in being able to really help somebody. And so once I've built rapport and I kind of have, have gotten them to trust me enough to tell me their story, I start to ask them questions about their belief system. Because that might, and again, I start every, I do a lot of public speaking. I do a lot of live events and I always start everyone with like, Hey, my beliefs are not necessarily in congruence with how everybody else in the world believes. So just take these as this is what Jay Nixon thinks about his personal life. And if you think some of this might work for you, perfect, right? But everything I say is just my belief system. And so what I do is I try to, I start questioning, I start asking them questions about their belief system. Like, is that yours or has that been programmed into you by someone else? And the first time you ask somebody that question, it's, it's, it's a little, not off-putting, but it's confusing. They're like, well, what do you mean? And then I kind of give them examples of like how, like, you know, I had to break old programming in my own life, right? Like with trauma, with, you know, thinking that I'm supposed to have the corporate job with, you know, pretty much everything. If you think about it from the time we're born, we're being programmed, right? Or we're being plugged in information is being plugged into our brain, right? Because when they don't want you going to school as a little kid, as a, you know, as a renegade, having all your own thoughts, right? You need to do certain sets of things in order to get certain sets of rewards. And so it's kind of like that, even as an, into our adulthood. So when you ask an adult, like, is that your belief or is that somebody else's belief? And then they start to unpack that and think, well, gosh, you know what? I don't, I'm not sure if that's my belief or not. Like, that's just what I've always been told or what I've always done. So sometimes it's as simple as that, getting them to get an awareness. And one of the easiest things to do, I just did a live event um, 
last weekend and I started the entire event by having people define certain words. And they were simple words. They were like success, health, failure. Um, I had them define money. I had them define love. Like just basic, con- we, we use those words every single day. It was so eye-opening, so mind-blowing for them. They were like, I've never even thought about this. And, and, and one of the caveats was like, I'm like, this isn't Webster's Dictionary. Do not Google this and write down a definition. I want to know like when, I, when you hear that word, just start writing. Like, what does it mean to you? And so there were about 20 people in the room and every, all the, everyone had a different definition. There were some mm-hmm. similarities. And then when we started to unpack those definitions, that's when it got really cool. It was like somebody was like, well, my, this is what my mom told me that money was, or this is what my dad said success looked like, or this is what money means to me. You know what I mean? All those things. And it was so eye-opening. And I've received so many messages just, of course, this week. And they're like, I can't stop thinking about that. And I think so that's one thing. And it's a great way because we don't think about that. Like mm-hmm. people don't think about what their definitions of things are. And, not, and more than that, like, why are those your definitions of that? Yeah, that's good. I'm curious, like, have you had one of those moments in your own life where you've started to like, oh, I I was thinking a certain way, like maybe something more recent for you that you've had a little breakthrough on? Gosh, I I tend to have them quite often. And so I'm I'm consistently and this has been really um, for me over the course of the last like six to 12 months, I've really been like diving into this. But I've had a lot of instances where I'm so type A, head down, just go after it, that, that like you were saying a while ago, like you're, we're always being spoken to, right? You can call it your intuition, you can call it the universe, you can call it God, you can call it whatever it is. I have the propensity to be a bit hard-headed. And so sometimes the whispers don't get through. Sometimes the tap on the shoulder doesn't get through. It takes my significant other, Lori, will say like, the, you know, they have to bring the sledgehammer out for you because, <laughs> and so I have, like, I've had instances where, you know, I've, it's been sledgehammer moments where, you know, I needed to, to do something different to, you know, one of those, I'll give you an example. Like um, I've, I've always been, I shouldn't say always, I've always been on a quest for like the, you know, being in better shape. So one of my goals is every year on my birthday, I want to be in better shape than I was the year before. Obviously, there's going to be a point of diminishing return at some point, but I'm still doing pretty good, right? So I try to maintain below 10% body fat year round, want to be as healthy and fit, want to be as mobile as I can be. What I realized as I've now turned 48 is that the way I treated myself in my late 30s, early 40s, even though on paper looked as if someone who was, you know, super healthy, super fit was extremely overdoing it. Right. And so I've had to intelligently actually pull back the reins on the way I treat myself and treat myself a little with a little more kindness and a little more support. But I mean, I would, I would, I mean, I would do radical things. I would, you know, I would get on an assault bike for an hour and try to ride for a thousand calories. I would do just insane, ludicrous, dumb stuff. Right. Because I, I had this, I still have that, that chubby kid in my brain who I, you know, I so don't want to ever be again. And so, you know, sometimes that would drive me to do these ridiculous things. I mean, I've done crazy food things and hopefully I'm maturing a little bit as I approach 50 and those things are a thing of the past. But yeah, so I have had those things where, you know, my body would basically just break down or shut down based on just, you know, not listening. Yeah, that's powerful. I mean, I've had something somewhat recently where with pain, and, and I, I could see that there was like, there was uh, my right hip was bugging me at one point. And um, I started to ask the question in my head, am I, am I just getting old? Like, am I hitting a point where like, yeah. I have to start living with these things. And I remember entertaining that thought and just going like, but would I be okay with that? And, and it just, no, I, I wouldn't oh. be okay with that. And so then I dug into my tool belt and realized I had some tools I wasn't even thinking about from, for my own health and yeah. was able to move through it. But I find it so interesting that like to have those little conversations with ourselves, like, is this real? Like, yeah. is this something I can live with? And then I think at some, some point, you know, just like you shared your story, you, you recognize that, no, this is, I'm not okay with living with this. Right. You know, whether that be dietary choices or a weight thing, um, you know, relationship stress, whatever it might be. But at some point, I think we have to, you know, have our come to God moment where we're really asking that question, like, would I be okay living with this pain, this emotional pain, the physical pain, the physical weight, whatever it might be. 
Yeah, um, that's something I, I, I try to get people to... I, I don't think people, I don't think we as humans, I don't think we have enough of those conversations with ourselves. I think we yeah. get in these, these minutiae of just, mo- just like kind of zombifyingly moving through life and thinking that this is how it's supposed to be. Or like you said, oh, well, I'm just getting older. I'm supposed to have aches and pains and feel this way and whatever. And those, that's a belief system, right? It's because like you hear people say, oh, well, you're just getting older. It's like, I, ref- and so for me, I refuse to believe that I refuse for that to be um, the reason why I can't do what it is that I want to do. And I'm the kind of person I'll have those conversations with myself. And so as somebody who does this for a living, like, I mean, always trying to encourage people, like, how do you feel about this? Like, when's the last time you had a conversation with yourself about, right? And most people don't even have a relationship with themselves, much less have conversations. They're really just kind of like, disconnected from their physical body and their mental body and their emotional body. And it's kind of like they're living in a parallel life or something of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, And I feel like that starts at such a young age too. Right. And it takes me back to this story. Our um, youngest and oldest um, had this grand friends Mm -hmm. program in their school where their classes would go to these old um, uh, what do we call seniors, them? Homes. seniors homes yeah. mm-hmm. and um, do art with them and whatnot. And there was a woman there. She asked a question to all the kids. Oh, what happens when you get old? And they started putting their hands up. Oh, your yeah, your hip starts to hurt. You can't walk and you can't mm-hmm. eat and all of this. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, like these kids are getting conditioned already Yep. to what to expect at a certain age. Mm-hmm. And so there's so much unlearning that needs to happen for us to actually step into what the potential actually is in this body. So what if we started saying different things? And what if we started teaching our kids that there is potential that we don't have to buy into what this norm is. And I think that would change how all of us are perceiving health and life and the decisions that we make, because or else people get into this story of, well, it's inevitable. So I'll just have that chocolate cake. It's inevitable. Right. I'm going to have that pain. So it's okay. I just won't take care of myself now because it's, it's coming my age. I'm over 40 now mm-hmm. over the hill. So I yeah. think there's so much, it's great that, you know, people like you in the position that you're in are helping people unlearn and unravel. So I'd like to um, hear from you if you've recognized specific patterns. So what I mean by that is in my practice with women, when I see something show up, for example, if it's, if she's growing a lot of fibroids or cysts, often there's some form of stuckness in her life. If she's Mm -hmm. has endometriosis, often she's had a trauma where she didn't feel safe when she was young. So I'm curious with individuals that maybe have a challenging time losing weight. And if weight is their safety somehow, have you linked what's happened? Maybe even if it's unsaid when they were younger or a pattern that they're carrying with them. Totally. I mean, by I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the linkage, but I, gosh, again, I hate to use the word always and whatnot, whatnot but like people who struggle with weight loss issues or, or with, with being overweight, I would say nine times out of 10, I, there's definitely a linkage to some form of, of trauma, whether it be as a child or whether it be in, in adulthood. And so, you know, I don't think that until you get a grasp on that, you're always going to, I think humans are always going to try to find a, maybe a vice isn't the right word, but like, you know, we, we want two things. We either want to diminish or decrease pain and increase pleasure. Right. And by pleasure, I mean, happiness and like feeling great and all those kind of things like that, but we want to avoid pain. And we've got this perception that if you mask it long enough and hard enough with enough things that you won't feel that pain anymore. But we all know that like, you know, in the dark, you know, I wrote a chapter in in my first book about like, it's what you do in the dark, right? It's like, in those times when you're by yourself, like, there's no level of masking that works, right? There's no level of, of food that works. There's no level of booze. There's no level of anything of that nature. And so what I try to get them to do is understand that until they address the situation, the trauma or the, maybe it's a, maybe it's an event that they're currently within, right? Like maybe it's a, a situational event that they're actually active, an active participant in right now. You know, I just try to get them to understand that until they address that event, that sustainable, long-term, healthy weight loss is probably not going to be an option for them, right? And so I definitely, I never use the D word, like I don't believe in diets. And so when someone comes to me, like, I'm, if you're here for that, 
then I'll, I can direct you somewhere else, but it's not the, it's not the mode of, of, of work that I'm willing to do. Like I'm not the guy who's going to help you get ready for the summer vacation um, and by starving you and depriving you and doing all those things. Like I'm I want to teach you a lifestyle that's sustainable forever. So, you know, one of the things I always say, and the kind of what you said about, about kids and programming is I never want your kids to have to know who I am. I never want your kids to have to, to know there's somebody out there that's even like me. And so, and that's going to be, that's going to fall on you, right? I'm going to help you. And then you've got to transcend that down. So I try to get them to see that it's a much larger, um, you know, it's a much larger thing going on here than just their own personal weight loss, especially if they do have children. So, cause I'm, I believe everybody's a role model, right? Like I believe everybody's somebody's hero, like somebody's looking up to everybody. And if we took that on as more of a personal responsibility, then I think we'd make better decisions. And I think we'd be more willing to address the traumas that we've, we've gone through. I think a lot of times people don't because they perceive the, the reliving of it, right? The reenactment of that trauma. And what I try to get them to understand is that your body doesn't really understand whether that trauma is happening over and over and over again, or it just happens once and you keep thinking about it. Like you're going to release the same cascade of, you know, horrible, you know, hormones in your system every time you think about that said event or that said person or whatever it was. And so therefore your, be- your body's basically reliving that, you know, basically kind of like my psoriatic arthritis. Like I didn't know how to deal with it. I wasn't releasing it. I couldn't talk about it. And so it had nowhere else to go. So it had to manifest itself. So every time it just kept accumulating and accumulating and it, you know, it ended up creating this situation, you know, in my body. And so I think the addressment of the issue is one of the most important things. If somebody really is wants to have sustainable weight loss and not just weight loss, but like overall health, like, I can't tell you, like, I've still got, I mean, I'm never going to be a hand model by any chance. Um, but addressing it, dealing with it, right. Growing through it and realizing that like this happened for me, right. Not to me. Like I couldn't do what I get to do today if I hadn't have gone through all the things that I'd gone through. And so I look at everything as a blessing. Like I look at it as, I mean, would I've loved to have my father growing up. Absolutely. But I didn't get that. And so I've got two decisions to make. I can live in that tragedy and allow it to just completely derail my life, or I can use it as a, as a tool and as a resource. My best friend committed suicide when I mean, he was 25, when I was 25. And I've, and I've said to this day, like, that was one of the most pivotal and positive moments in my life. Also one of the most traumatic, because I, I made a decision that day that all those lives that, it, that it were lost before, you know, before I was going to take upon all that responsibility. And now I need to show up as a better version of me for all of, of my, the people that I love that couldn't. So it was just my, my change in belief, right? I don't believe that. I don't believe that my dad getting killed when I was five was a tragedy. I don't believe that it was something that, you know, you should feel sorry for me for. Like, I believe that it was my path and it is what's given me this, you know, this fortitude to keep going and to want to help more people. So I think, I think everything's, I think everything happens to us. I mean, yeah, for us and not to us. And I think it's, it's all about the belief system. Mm-hmm. And how freeing is that when we can shift? Oh my gosh. Moments, right? mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I grew, I was such an angry misguided. Like I had no idea how to process an emotion. Like, you know, I'm a six, seven, eight years old. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm supposed to cry. I don't know if I'm supposed to be mad. I don't know if I'm supposed to be sad or happy or whatever you know, you don't taught those things, right? It doesn't come with a playbook. It's like, okay, you're, you have nothing to recall it to. It's like, you know, you're five years old. What are you going to do? And so for me, it just, it, you know, it manifested as all this like anger and like fear. And like, that's really what it was always, it was always all fear. And the fear then manifested itself as all these other crazy things. And then when I just dealt with it, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I wasted so much of my life being afraid of everything. Right. I was afraid to love you because if I love you, you could die. I was afraid to be close to you because if I was close to you, then you could die. I'm like, you know, it's just it was a belief system. And I created it as a, you know, I let I let a five-year-old run my life for a long time, which if you think about that, like that sounds crazy. You're not gonna hire a five-year-old to be the CEO. Like no. get in here and get in here and go to work, right? Yeah. But we do stuff like that. And so I'm big, I'm a big believer in trying to get people to 
get an awareness around that is like, listen, bad things have bad thing happen, bad things happen to amazing people, but it's only because that amazing person has a bigger purpose and they can do something with that. And so that's my personal belief. I know that's hard for some people to digest, but I think the better, if you can get to that place, I mean, life gets so much better and so much more awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it reminds me of the book, um, Mad Search for Meaning or Mm -hmm. The Choice Choice by Mm -hmm. uh, Edith Edgar. And and, I mean, because yeah, one of my questions to you is going to be like, well, how do you, how do you meet that person that is just so deep in their trauma that, that when you say something so foreign to them, like what you just shared, um, you know, however, in what you've shared is that that's a big trauma, you know, yeah. as it would have been for anyone living through the Holocaust or in, in any sort of these wartime circumstances or losing a parent at such a young yeah. age, that, that it starts to put things in perspective that that we, you know, in many cases, that it, it's more that the opportunity that that arises as a result of that is is our, our own awakening, our own purpose driven life that, that that's available to us. Um, but making that jump or being open to the idea that we yeah. have also live that way to, as you used your, the words like to actually be a hero for someone else. Yeah. And sometimes I, that, I feel like that's where that crossover can happen. When you can start to recognize that you actually have a responsibility in your story, in your history to now be a hero for someone else. And, and to like, realize you're not broken, right? I think a lot of people yeah. come in and they feel mm-hmm. broken because they've been told they're broken because mm-hmm. I can't tell you, how many times somebody, if, if I tell that story, right, what's the first thing somebody says to me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Which is natural, right? I'm not mad at yeah. people for that, but that, that basically says, Oh, you're, you're broken. I want to help you. I want to hu- hug you and hold you, which, you, which I love, which is awesome of people. But so I start, you know, I start trying to get people to understand, like you've been programmed to believe you're broken and I want you to, and I just try to get them to see it through a different lens. Right. And sometimes that's, it takes more than one conversation, but I just try to get them to see it through the lens of how I see them. Right. And sometimes if you tell somebody how you see them, like, listen, I see, I see an amazing, strong, unbelievably capable human. And they're like me. And I'm like, yeah, you, right. And you got to start to get, I often tell people this, like you need to believe in my belief in you more than you believe in yourself right now. Cause it, it and I get it. Right. But trust me, I believe in you so strongly. And if you'll just trust me, right? I'm not that crazy that you are something more amazing you could ever fathom, then they can slowly start to unpack that, right? Because it's not, healing trauma is not something that we just, I I wish it was easy as reading a book. Mm -hmm. Like that would have been amazing, right? Like, oh, I read a book and now I'm cool. Like, you know, I'm going to be awesome, right? It's consistent, you know, work. And, but I think the most important thing comes with, it's got to be the desire, right? Like I wanted to shift. I wanted to change. I wanted to take all of that fear and turn it into power and positivity. And so I don't think without that desire, I would have ever been able to do that. I think the second component to that is like who you get around, right? Like you need to be around people who believe that you're more than that person who went through that thing. Mm -hmm. And that's how some people, some people only recognize us as the person who went through that. Right. And so if that's how you're being recognized by the people that you're closest to, well, then how are you going to identify? All right. So a lot of times I get people just like it goes all the way back to definitions. Right. Like the simplicity of like, how, how do you identify? Like, who are you? Right. And if somebody describes themselves as a person of trauma. Right. Well, then that's how they're going to show up to the world. And then that they're going to get more of that because that's all they're looking for. And so I just try to get them to start to see the world maybe through a different lens, through a different view and trust that there's something bigger out there. And then I try to get them around more people that are kind of going through that same thing. Right. They're like, oh, well, like, OK, you went through something, too. Right. And you're you seem happy. Well, then maybe it is possible. Right. Maybe there is something more for me out there. So I think there's a lot of layers and I wish it was simple. And it, 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 well, let me, let me reverse on that. It is simple, but it's challenging. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like you, you know, you don't need a PhD, like you don't need any of that stuff, but it takes work, right? You got to really want to do it. You got to really want to come through the other side. And and I think if you can give somebody a purpose for doing that, you know what I mean? Like maybe they have other children or maybe they have other responsibilities, or maybe they can show up in a bigger way in the world and like, hey, I'm gonna use this to 
just to give this message to other people. I think there's a power in that as well, giving somebody something bigger than themselves to kind of like look forward to. Mm-hmm. And you're also giving them hope, right? Like totally. you were saying, when you start to see that I'm not alone, I'm not broken, there's other humans that are going through their own story. It might look a little bit different or manifest a little bit different, but it, we're all really the same. Because like you were saying before, the two desires that we have is to either run away from pain yeah. or move towards pleasure. And when we're stuck, even in that relationship, we can't see beyond where we're stuck. But once yeah. we can look at the bigger picture of why we're here and what it would look like if we weren't here tomorrow, how do we want to spend our today? Yeah, I think it can take away all of those stories and identities we carry with us. And that's why I'm so willing to share my story. Like writing my second book was not easy. Like, I mean, I, I, I basically lay out the the four deaths that happened from the time my dad was killed when I was five until my best friend um, committed suicide when I was 25. And in the middle, like one of those was like my next door neighbor was kind of like my my fatherly figure. Like he was, you know, I, he my, my mom put herself through nursing school. So she was always gone like two hours away. So I would come home and he would always say, call me, say, hey, come over. I made you food. On Christmas Day, when I was 17 years old, he had a heart attack and died. And I had to give him CPR until the paramedics got there. And he passed away on the way to the hospital. And I just used the, I used to use the wrong language there because when I was 17, I felt like I had to. But now that I know as an adult, like I got to be there to do that because the only other people in the house were his wife, his granddaughter and his daughter. And if I hadn't have been there, one of them would have been tasked with that mm-hmm. duty And I'm thankful that I was there that day because I could handle it, right? I can't imagine them having to be in that scenario. That's the reframe though, right? Like when I'm 17, I'm not, I'm not thinking that I'm thinking, oh my, not another one. Like what is going down? Like I'm, I'm the most cursed person on the planet. And now, but then I'm going to, after I, you know, when I started my kind of transformational journey at 25, after, after Chuck's death, I started thinking about things differently. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I mean, yeah, that was horrible. I mean, Christmas day and you're at your, you know, it's like whatever. And, but then I'm like, well, what if I wouldn't have been there? Like, then that would have changed the complexity of three other people's lives, right? Like having to do something like that to somebody they love. And so again, I look at it as you were there because you're supposed to be there. You were there because you could handle it. You were there because somebody, so you could take the pain away from somebody else. And so I look at things differently than a lot of people do, but it's, And that's why I was willing to share. That's why I wrote the entire book is like, I wanted to tell people what I'd gone through. And then I wanted to give them a step-by-step process on, Hey, this is kind of what I did and what I still do. You know what I mean? Like those, those deaths still happen, right? I can still think about them and get sad if I want to, or I can think about them and be like, Hey, that was just another, you know, another piece of my puzzle that is allowing me to continue to be a a better version of myself for the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm a great story yeah thanks for sharing yeah absolutely <laughs> what and what a powerful reframe you know mm-hmm. yeah because uh, to your point you know how many times are we telling the story of where we're victimized yeah. over and over and over again even if we can slowly start to see it in a different kind of way but it's it's really you know part of what gives you so much passion and purpose is all of these experiences of like no like i i need to step up and you know to, to use your words to be a hero for someone and yeah. uh and i think that's a what a what a beautiful opportunity to really to to appreciate that right absolutely yeah. you know and in the moment sometimes it's challenging right like because oh, when you're in the moment yeah. it's like it's i mean come on but that's one of the techniques that i that i try to teach my clients is i call it a positive reframe and it's not always easy right and i'm, I'm like hey the first couple of times that, I, that you do this you're gonna hate me you're gonna be like most ridiculous thing i've ever heard of in my life jay like how do you want me to positively reframe this and i'm like if you'll just trust me pro- promise I get more notes from past clients on like this one thing you taught me has changed my trajectory because I'm no longer angry. I'm no longer looking at myself as a victim and I can now like take micro events, right. And be like, this is okay. Like, this is not a big deal. Like I'm going to use this as a way to better myself or better the environment or better the, you know, the people that I'm around. And it's not always just about me and the tragedy. And so it's a technique, but again, it's something that has to be, you know, it's reps, right? Rep number one is always more challenging than rep number 10,000, right? It's like, you know, for you guys, like when you first opened your practice, patient number one was a lot more challenging than patient number 10,000, right? It's like, cause it's like, it's reps. Like, you know what to do now. Like it feels good. It flows. And so 
there's there's always a transitionary phase, but you got to be willing to step into that, and, and you got to change the change, right? And so, and, but those changes can be micro. Those changes can be really small, and I think that's another thing that I try to get people to understand is we live in this world where of instant gratification, and we want things like now, like and so, like Jay, I want to lose 100 pounds. How fast can I lose it? I'm like, if I answered that question, I would be lying, and you'd be disappointed eventually. So let's ask a better question. Right. So, and then, so we just kind of slowly unpack the real question. Like what question do we really want to answer first? So let's answer that question and then we'll get to the hundred pounds, but that's a given, but we're going to have to answer a bunch of questions and, you know, in between there, you know, now and then. And so it's just about the questions that we ask ourselves and the questions that we, you know, that we are looking for answers for. And I always say like the first question somebody asked me is never really the question they want the answer to. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I could give, I could say 30 days. They'd be like, awesome. I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm like, but they would know that's not true. They're going to get in their car and be like, this guy's full of shit. There's no way I'm going to lose the 100 pounds in 30 days. Right. Mm -hmm. But they would still say awesome because it's the answer. It's a, it sounds great. Yeah. Right. And so if I give them a real answer on that, then it's like, well, wait a minute. Then that requires another question. Right. And then another question, and another question. So, I mean, it's what you guys do. You're basically detectives. Right. People come in and they're like, OK, tell me about this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably not it. What do you got? Keep coming. Yeah. Right. And then you and then eventually you get to like the real thing and you're like, now we can help you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, just allowing and also creating space for somebody to step into that self inquiry, because mm -hmm. like you were saying before, we, many of us don't even have that relationship with self to ask the questions, yeah. when we're having a thought, or when we're experiencing a symptom, or a story is showing up for us again, we're just not questioning that because we don't, we're not connected enough to do that. So right. by allowing space for that connection, we can start asking those real questions. Mm -hmm. And back to the program, we've been programmed with answers. And so yeah. People will come into me and they'll, you know, they'll need to lose, you know, before they come in, they'll be like, Hey, I need to lose 60 pounds. I'll be like, awesome. Come on in. Let's talk. Or it'll be on a zoom or whatever. And the first, you know, one of the course, first questions I'll say, Hey, tell me about your nutrition. And their first words out of their mouth is like, no, I eat pretty good. Yes. Oh, you hear that every day. Yeah. And I'm like, you, my dad's really good. I'm like, yeah. I'm, a, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I love humor. Right. And so I'm like, I have a good rapport with my clients and I'm like, I'm like, Bobby, that can't be true. Right. I mean, if that was true, would we be on this Zoom call right now? Right. Like, you know, you, you, you can't need to lose 60 pounds and your nutrition be spot on. Yeah. I like you tell me what you eat. Right. And then they'll say, well, I had a chicken breast last night and I had broccoli. I was like, well, let's forget about last night. Right. And then you start to unpack it. And the next thing you know, it's like, well, there's a pot of ice cream on both ends of the spectrum. That's how I start my day. It's how I end my day. And sometimes I have one in the middle. Right. But I think we're programmed. Right. Because nobody wants to say. I eat like a garbage can. Like I really, I'll eat anything, anywhere, anytime, right? Nobody wants to say that. That's not fun, right? Even though it's true, it's not fun. And so you kind of got to meet them where they are. You kind of got to yeah. unpack that. It just reminds me of my sister and I were laughing about this once that when you hire someone to like help you clean your house, but you clean your house before they get there. So totally. they don't see the mess. Yeah. You <laughs> want them to somebody, think you're clean. Yeah. Like you, somebody shows up to your appointment. They want to give you their best version. Right? And why would you, why would you hire yeah. them in the first place? Right. Like it's, yeah. and, and you know, they probably walk in and they're like, I don't need to do nothing. Yeah. Well, these people are crazy. We're like, okay, I'll clean your house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're my favorite. You're my favorite client. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll come back every week. Yeah. Yeah, well, we always close our um, chat with this one question that I wanted ah. to see for you. Um, no, so I'm nervous. We, Here we go. Hold on. I was, I was, I've, been, I've been cool Pause. the whole time. Yeah, well, we spoke a lot about stories and beliefs. And I think this is something that we um, like the biggest fear that many humans have is is the loss of their own life and their mm -hmm. mortality. And when you've had relationship with people passing on around you, I think it's a thought process that you you do kind of investigate because I can resonate with that because I've had many um, people that I've lost over my lifetime. And I ask myself often, if I wasn't here today, what is the imprint that I want to leave behind for the next generation or for those that I love or just for the world? So that's my question to you. If you knew that tomorrow was your last day on this earth. Yeah, my hope would be that people just had the belief about me that I wanted to make an impact, that I wanted to do anything and everything I could to change their lives. Like 
one of my my kind of monikers that I use on a daily basis is I want to leave every person, place, and situation better than I found it. And that might be something really simple. That could be, you know, I'm from Texas, so I open the door for everybody. I say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Like I want you to have felt better in my presence um, than you know before I got there. So I just want to make people's lives better in whatever capacity that is, right? It's like I think I talk a lot about weight loss. But if weight loss isn't important to you, there's probably some other way I can help you. You know what I mean? Like, and so that's my mission and I'm not stuck on what Jay wants. Like, I want to help you get what you want. And so that's kind of like, I want people to understand that. And I want people to know that. And I just want to make people happy. So if I've um, had a conversation with you or been in your presence and you, you feel better than you did before, then I feel like I've done my job. Love it. Yeah. Thank you. Powerful message. Mm -hmm. Cool. You guys are awesome. I appreciate you. Mm -hmm. Jay, um, I mean, you got so much stuff to share. So if people are obviously <laughs> physical, you know, in your physical location, they come check out your studio. Tell yeah. us a little bit about your studio and then and then how to how to get your books and yeah, totally. And so I've got it. It's a it's a boutique food, fitness studio in Palm Desert. Um, I'd consider it kind of like a small per. It's about a thousand square feet personal training studio. We do small group classes, one on ones. Um, the easiest way to find me is just go to my website. It's Thrive foreverfit.com. So the word thrive, the word forever, the word fit.com um, in my books, my any, my YouTube, my podcast, my everything is on that. Or you can just Google Jay Nixon and I'll, I'll pop up everywhere. Awesome. Thank you. Well, we've found a new brother. Mm-hmm. I appreciate you're, you guys. You guys are awesome. Inside mm-hmm. out. Oh, it's just been Thank such you. a great conversation. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, one of the core things that we always want to make sure we leave people with is this understanding of, of hope and possibility and, and seeing seeing things in a, hopefully a different way <clears throat> than when they came onto the podcast. So, and I think you delivered that beautifully today. So I hope so we much. did. I hope we did. And if I can do anything for anybody, I'm, I'm a message away. Love it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys.